The episode six time jump was to introduce Allison and Rhaenyra's children as young adults, and then this time jump was to make those young adults adults. So it was important to age them up again and recast again to get them up to the appropriate age. So they're all in the 17 to 21 age range across the span of both families. Nephews? <laughs> As the years have gone by post Alicent's outburst, Alicent has found religion as a way to redeem herself. We know that Alicent holds closely to the new religion of the Seven Gods, which is not something the Targaryens do. It's part of what sets her apart from the house that she married into. In the scene where Rhaenyra and Daemon return to King's Landing for the first time, they see a difference and there were no words that were gonna describe the difference. There was nothing in particular that they would point out to us. We figured out how to make it read immediately. The big thing is a giant seven-pointed star that's hanging in the main hallway. Gaudy, if you ask me. I would say it's nice to be home, but I scarcely recognize it. It's become a much more quiet and conservative place. It's much more like a monastery now than it was. When we first saw it in episode one, it's full of light and life, and there's Targaryen erotica on the walls, dragon erotica, and now it's all been replaced with objects of the Seven, and the murals have been covered up. Eight is essentially set in a hospice. The whole episode is essentially sitting by the bedside of a loved one who's dying. Father? <sighs> The dramatic tension of this episode does not happen until Viserys shows up in that throne room, because the thinking when Rhaenyra is standing there is it's a farce. Corlys has been potentially fatally wounded. Nobody knows whether or not he's going to survive, so there's now a question mark about who's going to take on the Driftmark throne. It's within Alicent's motivation to want Lucerys to be deposed because it disempowers Rhaenyra's side of the family, and he's a bastard anyway, so what is he even doing there? And to give Vaemon power, because if Vaemon takes power, then he owes the Greens, and the Valerian fleet will all go with them. I do not understand why petitions are being heard over settled succession. Vaemon, one of those guys who's not particularly likable, but he always tells the truth, and he can't help it, and he can't stop himself. For that reason, he's never really got very far in life. And yet, suddenly, in episode eight, he finds himself possibly in line to inherit the Driftmark throne. He also walks right into the midst of the contentious issue of Rhaenyra's children and their real father. Because he's a kind of a do-right guy and wants to always tell the truth, he misses just how strongly and heavily everybody feels about this. He knows that those children are not Valarian. They're white. They got brown hair. Very obvious. And everyone knows it. It's the pink elephant in the corner that nobody wants to talk about. But Vaiman is the one person who will talk about it and who will speak out about it. You may run your house as you see fit, but you will not decide the future of mine. This is something he's been holding on to for like 16 years. And when the petition goes completely sideways for him, he knows he's gonna fall on his sword, but I'm gonna fall on my sword my way. And my way is to tell the absolute truth. So even if nothing is done about it, everybody in this room will know her children. Vaiman becomes actually kind of a sympathetic character in that moment. He goes out with a bit of honor. I have to say this, he did it from behind. Didn't come to me face, did he? Nah, mate, couldn't do that. <laughs> he can keep his tongue. Viserys, after the petitions, demands that there's a family dinner and that we all sit and eat together. It's the Last Supper, it's Viserys' last stand. It's the father and daughter's story finding some sort of resolution and closure. Unexpectedly, there's a brief moment of, oh, maybe things are gonna be okay. How good it is to see you all tonight, together.
one of the issues with his leadership through the series is a refusal to step up and intervene, to speak with clarity and to lay down the law and to stand by choices that he makes. For the first time, certainly in Rhaenyra's life, she really watches him do it. He stands by the family, both sides of the family, in this final dinner. It's like all this corruption and all this fighting, this is what it does. This is what being a king does. This is the effect of all of this on me. Why can't we just love each other? It sounds really naff, but it's like, why, why, why can't we just love each other? Why can't we just make this work? Let us no longer hold your feelings in our hearts. The crown cannot stand strong if the house of the dragon remains divided. But set aside your grievances. Forget me as your king, just love me as the man that I am to you and your family. If not for the sake of the crown, then for the sake of this old man. Rhaenyra and Allison have always been trying to pull themselves back from the precipice. The idea is that they never really wanted to get into this rivalry together, but they were driven there by the patriarchy, by the men in their lives. And they have a real friendship and relationship and a real love for one another that might have gotten cold and stale over the years, but it did exist. And then as soon as Viserys leaves the room, the young kids who don't appreciate the history that has gone into this and what's at stake, kick it off again. His only purpose is to try his best to put the house right before he dies, which he feels like he does until he doesn't. This is a guy who was unwilling to make enemies of one side to do what was right. So a lot of things in his life went unsaid because he was trying to always tamp down aggressions. And it leads to this final moment where his final message is unclear. He's very ill, he was in a lot of pain, they put him on medication, and he wakes up in that middle of the night trying to have this unfinished conversation that he had with Rhaenyra, not realizing that the woman sitting at his side is not Rhaenyra, but Alicent. So he speaks to her as if she's Rhaenyra, and Alicent picks out words like Aegon and Prince, who is promised, and prophecy, and, and whatever, and doesn't understand all the context going back into it because she never heard the Song of Ice and Fire because she was never his heir. Don't take milk of the poppy and then impart really important information just before you die. That's the learning curve on that one. <laughs> So it is a bit of a tragic end, but it goes to the idea that this prophecy is a bit of gossamer sliding through your fingers and it's hard to grasp all at once. And also his lack of dealing with the issues at hand at his court that he was responsible for during his life. I don't think he ever wanted to be king, it's a burden. He's just doing a duty. He was too human to be king. It was genuinely touching watching Paddy die multiple times from multiple different angles. Mm -hmm. When he takes his last breath, he maybe feels like he's done all he can and he's put his house right. He did his best. He kept this secret belief in the prophecy and kept that with him until the day he died. And that's all he could do. In some respects, he wasn't the right man for the job. But in history, he, he kind of was the right man for the job, you know, 200 years later. So he does have a legacy.